All right, so today we're pleased to have uh, Steve Audi uh, talking about model structures from models of hot. So please, whenever you're ready, Steve. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Thanks, Tim. Thanks to the Topos Institute for hosting this unconventional series of lectures. Um, also for giving up so much space in your schedule for hot, there's this is the third, no, the fourth in a series of kind of tutorial style lectures on hot. And um, so that's great. And I hope that it, it uh, is worthwhile for the audience. I wonder if uh, some, I'm kind of assuming now what's gone before in those previous lectures about hot. If some of you, I'm, I'm gonna assume that at least some of the basic material that was covered going forward. So if some of you haven't seen those, this would be a good time to go watch those on YouTube and then come back and watch this on YouTube or just listen now and then do that later. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, the way things are set up now in modeling homotopy type theory is we use uh, the formalism and uh, machinery of Quillen model categories. And Quillen model categories, I think everybody knows, were originally invented to model abstract homotopy theory. And they've been around for how long, 70 years or 60 years or something like that. And, um, and nowadays we're using them to model homotopy type theory. Uh, we use kind of the same machinery as abstract homotopy theory. Now that wasn't always the case. When things, you can look back with retrospect and recognize that the groupoid model, it, which was the first kind of higher dimensional model of type theory, actually is a model of this kind using a Quillen model structure on the category of groupoids. And that's what Mike was talking about last week. And then he showed that that approach can also be used for stacks, not just for the groupoids. And then, the, but the early models of hot, we used a weak factorization system and also Quillen model categories to get the identity types in particular, the intentionality, and then using that framework to get the pi types and so on. And then finally, Vyvodsky gave a, the idea of a univalent universe in the Quillen model structure on simplicial sets where the fibrant objects are the con complexes. But he used the Quillen model structure in a kind of implicit way. And um, it wasn't really until Mike's uh, recent breakthrough result showing that every infinity topos is a model of hot, that this kind of, I would say, crystallized the idea that um, a Quillen model structure is the right way to give a model of hot. And um, so, so this is just what I said, it, as, as time went by, it became more clear that a Quillen model structure is a good way to model homotopy type theory. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is in a certain sense, reversing that model construction. That is, we're gonna start from a model of hot that's not necessarily in a Quillen model category. And from that, we're gonna construct a Quillen model structure on the underlying category of that model. So it's a kind of, in a sense, it shows that, that that's a good way of modeling hot is a Quillen model category. And then the Quillen model category that comes out of it uh, looks a lot like an infinity topos. And the idea here is that we're really kind of reinforcing, strengthening that idea of hot as the internal language of an infinity topos. In the same way that higher order logic, intuitionistic higher order logic is the internal language of a one topos. And uh, just kind of by the way, it also gives a strange new way of constructing a Quillen model category using some type theoretic ideas. And that's really gonna be my main emphasis today is how to start from a model of hot of a different kind which I'll tell you in a moment. And from that, construct a Quillen model category using some new ideas coming from type theory. So what is a model of hot if not something in a Quillen model category? Well, there's another approach to building models of hot that's been developed. 
And that's a more maybe syntactical approach where you formulate in a different system of logic, like higher order logic or extensional type theory, a certain kind of structure. And then you translate the language of hot into that structured extensional language. And uh, this approach has the advantage that these models can even be formalized in a proof assistant and have been. So that's kind of a cool aspect of that approach, but it's very different than the Quillen model category approach. And uh, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna describe that more syntactical approach also semantically by saying, well, let's suppose we have an elementary topos that's representing our extensional type theory or extensional higher order logic. And then in that topos, we have a certain structure, which is the axiomatic theory that we were using if we were doing this construction syntactically. So the structure looks like this. I think it was first given in this form by in a paper by Orton Pitts, but it's been studied by several other people. And I think the idea is due to Kokon. Um, and he's also done, uh, he and his collaborators have done this sort of thing too. But I'm kind of following Orton Pitts because it's a little closer to the categorical setup. So I'm gonna call a pre-model in an elementary topos, a triple like this, where on the first uh, factor there, we have an interval, which is an object with two points. Think of them as the end points of the interval. And this interval for my uh, construction today is required to be tiny. And what that means is the exponentiation by it has a further right adjoint, which following Levere is called the root or the ith root of an object. So that's an interesting property. It's a property that you'll see why it holds in this case. Um, the second component in this pre-model structure is a representative for a class of monomorphisms that are stable under pullback. So we assume a class of monos stable under pullback. And then we assume that that class has a terminal object that is a representing object, which is a sub-object here of the sub-object classifier. And I'm gonna require that that satisfy some conditions among others that it's a dominance and various other things. And then the third and final component of the pre-model structure is that we have a universal small map, a small map classifier. And this is maybe following the ideas coming from, well, on the one hand type theory, but also the Joyal and Mordike algebraic set theory and the axiomatic theory of small maps. And that small map is required to be closed under the type theoretic operations. So I'll say a little bit about, more about that. In the, uh, Steve, in the could I ask a question before you move on from this yeah, slide? Yeah, sure. Um, I can, I can so uh, it's, it's is under it? this I, definition of pre-model that just, does not include. Uh, who's that, who is asking? Can I just? I'm just curious who it is. I don't recognize your voice. But I'm sorry. I'm David. Uh, oh, Jazz David Myers. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, David. Hi. Sorry, I can't unmute my video. So no, it's fine. Um, uh, so in this definition of pre-model, this would not include simplicial sets where delta one is the, the interval because it's not tiny. This that, particular setup is not including simplicial sets. That's a different, so this you know, is a we more can cubicle way of thinking about homotopy type. Yeah, theory. this is the Orton Pitts setup and the Kokon setup is a cubicle approach. That's not to say we can't modify this to do it simplicially. It's just this is the kind of basic setup here, which makes it easy to explain. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Now, I'm not going to use this setup to construct a model of hot. That's what it's invented for. I'm going to abuse it to instead construct a Quillen model structure on this topos E. And so that's the kind of interesting variation here. I start with something that's made for a model of hot, and then I can make a Quillen model structure out of it. So that's the approach today. The construction, so Quillen model structure, you all know what it is because Mike told you last week, it's three classes of maps, co-fibrations, weak equivalences, and fibrations. And they satisfy some axioms that Mike told you last week and I'll mention them again soon. And I'm gonna construct that from this pre-model business. And that's already been done in a few cases. So the ones that I think have been done kind of thoroughly are these, they're the cubicle set ones. So this is David's question, where there are these different varieties of cubicle sets. I'm not gonna to go too much into that. 
And then, but other options that can be done by the same method involve a cubicle realizability models. That's something under construction now. There are higher stacks, Thierry Cocon is pursuing that. And then you can also do simplicial and cubicle pre-sheaves by kind of modification of this approach and quasi categories I think is farther off down the road as a possible uh, target. So that's kind of where this stands, this approach. So today I'm gonna to do what's called the dedicated cubicle sets. The idea is that the index category here C is the full subcategory of cat on the finite powers of the arrow. The, just the two element category uh, one with one arrow, non-trivial arrow between the two elements. I take all the finite powers of that. And uh, that's a finite product category, obviously. And it's one that we already know and love. It's the Levere theory of distributive lattices. And that's why it's called the Dedekind cubes because Dedekind kind of initiated the study of distributive lattices. And uh, so in there, we're gonna have, first of all, our first ingredient is the interval. And the interval is just going to be the representable pre-sheaf represented by the arrow. And in particular, that's going to have, in addition to its required endpoints, it's going to have these connections because this object in the Levere theory is the generic distributive lattice. And so this thing has a distributive lattice structure down in C, which it then inherits up in pre-sheaves on C because Yoneda preserves these finite products. And so it takes this distributive lattice structure on two up to a distributive lattice structure on I. So we have this, and these connections are something that are already known from older work in homotopy theory. People, before they did simplicial sets, they used, in fact, cubical sets. I think Kahn's early work and Serre and other people used cubicle sets. And these connections were something that was studied in that connection. So there they are. And moreover, this interval is tiny as we need it to be because C is closed under finite products. So that's a nice exercise for you. If you're a topos inclined, as I guess everyone here is, show that if the index category is closed under finite products, then you have these right adjoints to exponentiation by representables. Okay, so that's the first, that's this ingredient and this ingredient. I'm pointing with my cursor, can you guys see that? Okay, good. So now what is this co-fibration classifier? This representable class of monos is called the co-fibration, co-fibrations and it has a classifier. Um, from a logical point of view, we think of the, about this maybe as a modality on the propositions and the modality satisfies this dominance law. This is one way of axiomatizing this, but it turns out that this is really equivalent to saying that the monos that are classified are closed under composition. So that's something that we want. Dominance is coming from Pino Rossellini, by the way, from the kind of domain theoretic world. For today, I'm gonna to keep things simple. I'm just gonna take this co-fibration classifier to be all monos, the subobject classifier. So I'm not gonna say much more about that, but there are other interesting choices for other cases. Here's just one to mention one. You could take all those monos whose components are complemented subobjects in set. Huh? Well, that makes sense if set is not Boolean, right? Like what if you're doing, what if set is axles CZF? You're doing constructive mathematics. Or what if set is just your name for the base topos that you're working over? Well, then the subobjects won't all be complemented. And so this condition will be non-trivial. So that's the idea. You have a, that's a possibility for the co-fibration classifier. But here today, we're just gonna make it easy. We'll take the subobject classifier. And finally, what is this universe V? Well. We can, one way to do it, there are various ways. We can take a hoffman streicher universe. That means take a large cardinal, consider all the sets that are smaller than that. That's a full subcategory. And then define this pre-sheaf. We say the universe at C is all the 
pre-sheaves on the slice over C that have small values. That's what's going on here. And then the universe of elements of those small things are the pointed pre-sheaves. And that gives us a structure of this form, which classifies small things, as I'll say in a minute. So an object in the topos now is small. I'll say if all of its values are small sets and a map is small, if all of its fibers are small objects. And then we have this V that I just constructed has this classifying property. Whenever you have a small map, that is a map with small fibers, there's a classifying map into V that classifies in the sense that this, it exhibits this thing as a pullback of this universal one. And of course, this universal one is small in a sense that um, I just explained. So this is an example of the kind of small map classifier that was in the work of Joel and Mordike way back when. And we can make sure that this universe is closed under the type theoretic uh, operations of sigma and pi just by picking our kappa that we started with big enough. Okay. So that's my stuff here that I'm going to be using. And now I'm going to construct a Quillen model structure out of those ingredients. And first I'll use this cofibration classifier to determine what the cofibrations are and then an associated weak factorization system. Then I'll throw in the interval and use this first weak factorization system to get another one with the trivial cofibrations and the fibrations. So that's, you know, two of my, two out of three of my ingredients here. And then I'll define my third ingredient, the weak equivalences to be just what they have to be for a Quillen model structure, namely the trivial fibrations followed by the trivial cofibrations. And now what I have to do is show that this definition of weak equivalence satisfies the three for two property, which says whenever you have a commutative triangle, if any two sides are in W, then the third side is also in W. So that's gonna be the main challenge here. The other two steps are pretty standard, although there's a little bit of variation there that might be interesting, so don't fall asleep yet. The third step is gonna involve some hopefully new ideas for you from type theory. So that's where the kind of type theoretic stuff comes into play. Okay, so specifically for this type theoretic stuff to prove the three for two property, we're gonna do it like this. We're going to construct a universal fibration, which is kind of a type theoretic idea, like a universe of vibrant things. And we're gonna construct it out of this universal small map together with a notion of a type of fibration structures, which is maybe a new idea. Then we'll show that this universal fibration is in fact univalent in the sense coming out of homotopy type theory and Vyvodsky's univalent foundations. And then we'll show that this univalence implies that the base object is in fact fibrant. And from that, there's a clever proof that shows that you have the three for two property for W. So how about that for a big detour? Right? Instead of just working in axiomatic abstract homotopy theory, equivalent model category style stuff, we go through this type theoretic detour involving univalence in order to finish up the model structure. And that methodology is uh, the brainchild of Christian Zettler, who I think is the first one who had this idea or this recognition that you can actually use univalence to establish the model structure rather than the other way around. So we're gonna apply that method. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through here, right? There are these steps, there they are. One, two, three, and then three has four sub steps. And I'm just gonna go through them one at a time, okay? So here's the first one, but this is a good time to ask a question if you not, if you don't know what's going on or you want to, some clarification. Okay, let's go on. So first we need a weak factorization system. Mike told us last week what a weak factorization system is. 
but I think you'll be reminded in a minute. And this is the one that has co-fibrations on the left and on the right, something called trivial fibrations. The co-fibrations, as I said, are just gonna be the monomorphisms for today. The trivial fibrations are gonna be just what they have to be, namely anything that lifts against a co-fibration. That means for any commutative diagram like this with a co-fibration on the left, there exists a diagonal filler, which makes the two triangles commute. So that's the right lifting property. And it defines the trivial fibrations. They're those maps that have this right lifting property with respect to the co-fibrations. Yeah. Now, there's an interesting kind of variation here. Because these co-fibrations are classified by this classifier, one can use it to show that there's a kind of structured notion here of cofibration, which can be reduced to special ones with a representable codomain. We can just look at cofibrations with a representable codomain and check the property, the lift, right lifting property against those. And then we can say, suppose we have a choice of such diagonal fillers for each such cofibration with a representable codomain. And of course, each lifting problem, I'm not putting that into the notation, that would be too much. But then we also require that whenever you take a pullback square like this, well, this thing is, we know a cofibration because um, the cofibrations are closed under pullbacks. This is another lifting problem. And so it has a selected diagonal filler by our assumed choice. And now we require that this triangle commute. That is, if I pull C back along this map and take its filler, that's the same as taking the precomposition of this filler for C along that map. So that is a structure now, an algebraic structure, literally, on this map. And we can show that a map is a trivial vibration, that is, in this sense, just in case it admits such an algebraic structure. And it turns out that the collection of all such algebraic structures is a small thing, and it even admits a classifier. I'll tell you a little bit later about that classifier. So it admits a classifier, and this gives rise to this notion of a kind of structured trivial vibration, not just a property of the map, but a algebraic structure on the map, and that's quite useful and we're going to continue to make use of that notion of a structured trivial vibration or structured vibration. One way it's useful is that it reduces the definition to a small amount of data, right? And then from that, we can make use of that to construct the factorization, which is the required other ingredients in the definition of a weak factorization system. So this is in fact an algebraic weak factorization system in the technical sense. And you can construct by an algebraic small, ar small object argument due to Richard Garner, the factorizations and prove that it's an algebraic weak factorization system. Okay, so, um, but let me just highlight this idea that we have this classifying type and that's kind of key to showing that we have this algebraic weak factorization system. That's, this thing's gonna come back later. Now we're gonna do the same thing for the other weak factorization system, the trivial cofibrations and the fibrations. First, we define the fibrations in terms of the trivial fibrations by saying a map is a fibration just in case when I do this to it, the result is a trivial fibration where this is applying a certain functor on the arrow category, which is determined by one or both of the endpoints of the interval. So I have, I'm throwing in the interval now. I take an endpoint. I use it to make this functor on the arrow category, which I'm not going to bother to tell you about because all you need to know really is that it's a functor, um, at least for the talk. And um, so, and I say F is a fibration if this functor takes it to a trivial fibration. Okay. 
Um, this is called the pullback Hom, it, or the Leibniz exponential or something like that. It's like more or less standard ingredient nowadays. And then finally, the trivial cofibrations, the left class are defined just to be the maps with the left lifting property against these vibrations. All right. Now, again, in order to get a factorization in this weak factorization system, we need to have a small set of generating data. And in fact, these trivial cofibrations can be cut down to a special sub class of generators, a subcategory, in fact, of generators. And again, it's the ones with a representable codomain and that are built in this special way. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but you can build them using the left adjoint to this operation by saying, take an arbitrary cofibration with a representable codomain, perform this adjoint operation using an endpoint of the interval. And what you get is a thing that's a kind of partial open box of this n plus one cube. So think of it maybe like this. Here's the n plus one cube all filled in. And here's this open box. It's like a horn from simplicial, uh, the simplicial model structure. You have the horns. These are kind of cubical horns. And this is how you define them. So we're going to say those are the test objects or the generating objects. And if a thing is a vibration, if it has a lifting structure against all these special ones. And again, we have this proposition that says something is a vibration just in case there's a coherent choice of diagonal fillers for all these special boxes here, these open boxes. And again, the choice has to be not just one for each, but a coherent choice that satisfies this property. And that again gives us an algebraic structure on F which again has a classifying type like this. Okay, so it's the same methodology again and again. We have this algebraic structure. We have this kind of general lifting property like in classical homotopy theory. Well, anyway, I won't look at there. And then we reduce it to an algebraic structure and that algebraic structure has a classifying type. And then as I already anticipated, the weak equivalences will just be the um, maps which are composites of these things which should already be weak equivalences. Now at this point, the way we've set things up, it's easy to show this required condition that the weak equivalences, which are also cofibrations, are exactly the trivial cofibrations that I defined in terms of a lifting property. The weak equivalences that are also vibrations are exactly the trivial vibrations that I defined in terms of a lifting property. And therefore, all that's left really for the Quillen model structure is to show that the weak equivalences so defined satisfy the three for two property. So the rest of the talk will be devoted to showing you how to do that. And that's where we have some kind of type theoretic strategy to show that the weak equivalences satisfy three for two. Okay, so now I'm going through my little Roman numbers here. The first one is this universal vibration. So first of all, what is a universal vibration? Well, it's like a small map classifier except for small vibrations. So it's a small vibration. And then it has a property that if I have any other small vibration, then I can exhibit that as a pullback of the universal one along some classifying map. Now, this kind of reminds you topos theorists of the subobject classifier, right? And indeed it's, you know, the same kind of idea. It's a classifying object. Maybe if you're a topologist, it reminds you of the idea of classifying spaces. Um, However, there's something missing here, and that's the uniqueness of this map. It's not unique in the way that the subobject classifier is, but it is unique in a certain way that uh, maybe we can discuss some other time or at the end of the talk if there's time. We're going to show, well, it'll come up in a minute. So anyway, that's the definition of a universal vibration, what I'm calling a universal vibration. 
And I'm going to construct one of these using that classifying type that I talked about with the fibration structures. So now I can finally tell you what that classifying type is about or what it's supposed to be. So I told you for every map, there's an associated classifying type of the fibration structures on the map. Okay. There's one for fibrations, there's one for trivial fibrations. And it's also over the same base. And it's also small. And now the way it classifies is this. Vibration structures on this map, remember those compatible choices, coherent choices of lifts, those correspond to sections of this thing, okay? So that family alpha for all cofibrations of chosen coherent lifts gives a section of this type of vibration structures. So that's the universal property of that thing. I'll say a little bit more in a minute how you construct that. And that it's small when A is small. Moreover, this has a good property that it's stable under pullback. So what I mean by that is this, if I take A over X and I have any map F and I take the pullback of A along F, then the vibration structures on the pullback are exactly the pullback of the vibration structures on the map that I started with. So when this square is a pullback, as indicated here, then this square is also a pullback. And that's the important property that we're going to make use of. And in order to get that to happen, by the way, uh, this is where we use the root functor on uh, the small tininess condition on I. So that comes into the construction of Fib A. Now, maybe just to answer the question that came up earlier, um, this can be done without that. Um, and in simplicial sets, if you wanna use this same kind of approach, you'll have to because the one simplex is not tiny. But in the way that we're doing things right now, uh, that's a very convenient way of making this stable type of vibration structures by making use of that tininess and you get the root. So now here's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna say, take the universal small map and take its type of vibration structures and let that be our object U, the base of our universal vibration. We define U to be the type of vibration structures on the universal small map. Then we define the map just by pulling back the universal small map. So that's my candidate for a universal vibration. Now, first of all, let's check when I pull back the type of vibration structures to you, that gives me by the stability that I mentioned, the type of vibration structures on this map, U dot, right? That was my condition. But because U is just fib V dot, this is just the pullback of U against itself. And so it has a section indeed, namely the diagonal. And so there's a canonical section of this thing, which tells me that this map is a vibration. So by this construction, the universal vibration has a vibration structure, a very canonical one. That's the first step. Now I have to show that it classifies. So suppose I have a small map and it has a vibration structure. Well, then that's a section of its type of vibration structures. Now take the classifier for the small map, call it A. This type of vibration structures is the pullback of this type of vibration structures for the universal small map along A, right? By the stability property. Therefore, this vibration structure on A is a factorization of the classifying map through this type of vibration structures, right? Because this square is a pullback, good? So now I've got my classifying map. I've got a factorization through this type of vibration structures but don't forget, 
this is the base of the universal vibration. And therefore, this outer pullback diagram factors through two pullback diagrams like this, this one being the definition of U dot over U, and this one being now the new classifying map for the vibration A. It's the classifier for A together with its vibration structure is this pullback square by the two pullbacks lemma. So that's how the, this construction gives me a universal vibration. So let's pull away the curtain and see how this thing comes up type from a type theoretic point of view. What I did was I constructed this type of vibration structures. And this is an example of a kind of type theoretic approach to things. The way you construct this thing, or at least the way one can construct it, is you can think of it as the type of proofs that A is a vibration using this propositions as types idea that Emily explained in her Topos Colloquium. Remember, something is contractible if there exists a proof that it's contractible and then there's a type of contractions, right? And you build that type by using the propositions as types. Sigma is existence, pi is for all and so on. So you can do exactly that same kind of thing and you can make fib A as the type of proofs that A is a vibration. So that's how it works. So then a vibration itself is just a pair. It consists of a, a family together with a proof that the family is a vibration. Now a family of types or family of objects is a small map that has a classifier. So we can really think of that as something going into the universe of small things. That's the A, together with a lift here, alpha, into the vibration structures of A. So type theoretically, what we have here is a sigma type. The U is built as the sigma over all small things together with their vibration structures. And then U dot is just the sigma over U, all these pairs like that, together with the first component itself, which is all the elements of that type. So type theoretically, this is a very natural thing to do this kind of magical way of constructing the universal vibration that we just saw is a very natural type theoretic thing. I'll say one more thing about it. This stability property that we used and that was so important from a type theoretic point of view, what this says is the following. We have a, we actually have a map fib on V, which takes a small thing to its small type of vibration structures. And then the way you get this type fib A is just compose the classifier for A with this map fib. So it's just a composite. So A is X into V and then fib A is just fib after A. And then the stability of pullback under pullbacks is just this. The pullback of fib A is just fib A after F using this classifying point of view. And then this fib A is fib after A and then composition is associative. And then A after F is the pullback of F. So that's all there is to it. So when you have things set up using these classifying objects, you kind of can take advantage of that type theoretic point of view. All right, so now that was step one of four. Step two, the, this universal vibration, in fact, is univalent in the sense of Voivodsky. So we're thinking, of course, secretly of this, or maybe not so secretly, as a universe of vibrant types, and this is a universal vibration as in a type theoretic universe. And then we want to show that this thing is univalent. And what that means, at least one way of describing it, is that if you take the type of all equivalences between two vibrant things, and then you take a projection down 
to one end of the equivalence, then that projection itself is a trivial fibration. Now, the reason that's a good description of univalence is that if we had a Quillen model structure, which we will eventually have, then this condition will tell us that that type of equivalences is actually equivalent to the identity type because the identity type is just the path space. That's the kind of fundamental idea of homotopy type theory is that the identity type of a type is its path space. And the projection of a path space is a trivial vibration. And indeed that's kind of characterizes it uh, up to equivalence is that it's a trivial vibration. And so if this thing is also a trivial vibration, then this map, which you can define between the two, will be an equivalence. And this is the more familiar, I think, specification of univalence, that identity between two types is equivalent to equivalence between two types. So that follows from this condition that this based, what I'm calling the based equivalences is a trivial vibration. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna give you the proof of this, or maybe I am. Um, so what does it mean? To say that this thing is a trivial vibration, oh, I see what's going on, going on uh, means this. It means that it has the right lifting property against all co-fibrations, right? So here it is. It classifies equivalences and then it projects out one end of the equivalence. To say that it has the right lifting property against all co-fibrations means if I give you any co-fibration over here, and I give you a vibration on C, that's B. This thing classifies vibrations over C, remember? So if I have a vibration over C, and then I restrict this vibration along the co-fibration to give me B prime, and then I have an equivalence over the restriction, then I can extend that equivalence to an equivalence over C, between B and something, which pulls back to this equivalence back here. So I have this data on the outside and I'm required to have this filler, but because this is a classifying object for vibrations on C, and this is a classifying object for equivalences of vibrations over C, this condition has another secret interpretation, which we can also write like this, this is the same thing I just said. If you give me a co-fibration and a fibration here over the codomain, then when I pull it back, if I have a equivalence of fibrations over the pullback, then there exists a fibration up here and an equivalence over here, which pulls back to that one. So it's exactly this same condition here expressed now in terms of the universal properties of those objects. And that condition is called the equivalence extension property. It says just what I, exactly what I just told you. And uh, that was the formulation that Wojewodski first arrived at for this thing. And he used it and proved it in order to show that the universal small confibration is univalent in the original model of the univalent uh, type theory that Wojewodski gave in simplicial sets. So that's the setup. Um, I think I'm not gonna actually rehearse that proof. I'll just mention that Kokan later gave a constructive proof of this. Wojewodski's proof is not constructive. Um, using the kind of type theoretic cubicle approach that we're talking about. And then now in this more recent work that is joint with Kokan, we have a more general version of this proof in a kind of setting of abstract homotopy theory, which holds for many other Quillen model categories. And in particular, it doesn't use the three for two property, which is what we're trying to prove using all this stuff. So there's a example of a new proof there using some type theoretic ideas. Okay, so that was step two. Step three, using univalence of the universal vibration, we can show that the base is a fibrant object. So Wojewski proved that separately, directly for consimplicial sets using minimal vibrations. Shulman gave a 
general proof from univalence, which is a nice idea. If you know that this thing is univalent, you can use that to prove that the base object is fibrant. Unfortunately, Shulman's proof uses three for two for W, so we can't use that now because that's what we're trying to prove. Kokong gave a nice proof, avoiding three for two, using a type theoretic idea of reducing con filling to something called con composition. That's a specifically cubical idea, at least currently. And uh, we have another variation, a new proof of this fact from univalence, avoiding three for two and not using con composition, but using a general property. And I think I'm gonna give you a little quick sketch of that if I may. So here's what I have to show. If I wanna show that U is fibrant, it suffices to show that this projection from the path space is a trivial fibration. I kind of mentioned that a minute ago. So let's set up a filling problem just like we did a minute ago for equivalence, but now for the path space and its projection. The projection from the path space is just take a path and then look at its end point here, right? That's what this means. It's evaluation at the end point of this map. And now suppose we have a filling problem. This is a cofibration. Well, look, this is a fibration over Z, right? And what is this? Well, if I were to transpose that, it would be a fibration over C cross I, right? And then this diagonal filler is a fibration over Z cross I, and then the Restriction gives you these commutative triangles. So let's just write that out the way we did before in terms of the universal properties of these objects. It looks like this. Here's my fibration B. Let me just line this up. Here's my B over Z right there. Here's my A over C cross I right there, A. And now, if I restrict B along my cofibration, I get this thing which should agree with the restriction of A along this endpoint inclusion. So think about this as a cylinder over C. It has two ends. Here's one of the ends going in. Take this vibration over the cylinder and look at its slice over that end. That should be the same as the restriction of B along the cofibration. So all the solid part is the basic setup. And now what I'm supposed to get is a new fibration D for diagonal over Z cross I. And that's exactly what this thing is. I need to get a fibration here, which pulls back or restricts down to B and restricts down to A. That's, that was my original data. So that filling problem translates into this condition. So here's a quick sketch of the proof. Take that pullback square over there and apply the functor cross with the interval. And then it lands over here and gives us a pullback square over here, preserves these vibrations. Now by this construction, show that this thing is actually equivalent to A over this cylinder. There's a weak equivalence here between these two vibrations, actually a homotopy equivalence because weak equivalences between vibrations are homotopy equivalences. And lo and behold, we have a setup here for the equivalence extension property, right? Here's a co-fibration, here's a fibration, here's its pullback, here's another fibration and an equivalence. And so the equivalence extension property gives us the rest of this. So that gives us the D that we were looking for by the equivalence extension property. And then of course we have to check that when I pull this back, I get the thing I started with and that's the proof. So that gives me the fibrancy of U from univalence. Finally, to finish up, we have to show three for two, right? So we wanna show three for two using the fact that U is fibrant and that's an idea that is due to Sutler and Sutler shows the weak equivalences satisfy the three for two property if we have this vibration extension property. 
Vibration extension says this, if you have a fibration and a trivial co-fibration, then you can extend it in the sense that there's a fibration out here, which pulls back to this one. So you can extend a fibration along the trivial co-fibration. And if you have that, given the rest of the setup, then you've got three for two for fibrations. So all we need is this now, and then we're done. So how do we get that from vibrancy of U? Well, let's just look here. We know that U is vibrant. We have a vibration here. We have a trivial co-fibration here. This vibration has a classifying map. This is a trivial co-fibration. Therefore, because U is vibrant, there's an extension to X prime of this map. And now because this is a classifier, that extension classifies a new vibration right here, the pullback of which is the one we started with. So there's our extension property. So the extension property, the vibration extension property is essentially saying that this base object is vibrant, right? And that's what we proved from univalence. So we used univalence, we proved that this thing is vibrant. That gives us the vibration extension property, which by Zottler's lemma gives us the three for two for the weak equivalences, which by what we said halfway through gives us the colon model structure. Done. Okay, that's it. There's some type theoretic stuff in there, but that's it. I think we're kind of come down to the end of the time. And uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, I have some discussion topics prepared if you'd like, but I'm also happy to discuss anything you want. But if there's not, then I'll propose my discussion. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Steve. Um, so people can unmute and ask questions um, or raise your hand if, if you prefer using the reactions button. How do I get the look at that? Hi, Steve. Sorry, I still can't. Um, That's okay. Use my video for some reason. It's David. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, so I was wondering um, how these. Uh, so this is a very elegant. Um, <laughs> very, yeah. very elegant well, argument. Thank you. Yeah, it's very so polished at this point because a lot of people have been polishing it for a few years now. So. Very nice. Um, I was wondering how these. Um, model categories compared with, say, if you did it for some of the usual cubical ones, how they compared with the uh, the uh, con quillin model structure on simplicial sets, or like the usual homotopy theory, in other words. Yeah, that's a good question. So that's something that is a current project that I mentioned in the beginning with the equivariance. And um, so there is a comparison between the um, cubicle model structure, either using one of the various different cubes categories and the simplicial sets. And that is not an equivalence for at least the Cartesian cubes by some results due to Zottler and also Ulrich Buchholz. And then Zottler had this uh, further idea to add equivariance to the cubes, which means you permute the dimensions of the cubes. And um, in some recent work now, or fairly recent with Thierry and Emily and Sattler and some other people, uh, Evan Cavallo, uh, we've been constructing a Quillen model structure using this method uh, on the equivariant cubes. And then Sattler has a proof that that one is indeed equivalent to uh, the Kahn Quillen model structure on simplicial sets at least assuming classical background logic. Great. So there's a classical proof that this procedure gives a model structure equivalent to the classical model structure on spaces when you add a little bit of equivariance to the cubes. So I think that's the an answer to your question. Great, thank you. Sure. So someone named Ken is asking uh, about something near the beginning, wondering whether there's a type theoretic interpretation of the tininess of the interval object. 
Ah, that's a good question. Tininess of the interval from a tight theoretic point of view. The thing is, it would be nice to get that into the type theory. And um, unfortunately, it's not really a type theoretic operation. It's not suitably stable under pullback. However, there is some work on adding to type theory one of the consequences of tininess in the form of a sort of depend, what they call a dependent right adjoint, which is a related construction which follows from tininess. So you can put that into the type theory. And I think there's a paper by, I think Dan Licata might be one of the authors and Lars Berkedal or Boz Spitters, I think are some names involved in that. And they make use of it, this dependent right adjoint in, oh, I'm gonna have a hard time remember, guarded recursive type theory or something like that. So there are various applications of this tininess in type theoretic settings as well. But the short answer is it's not a, it doesn't immediately translate over into type theory. You can also uh, represent it internally with the modality for, uh, I am. In, as in like uh, the Lakata, Orton, Pitts and Spitters, I think, mm -hmm. where they used it to construct the universe that way. Yeah, if you add to type theory a modal operator, in particular, the one that they're interested in is kind of taking global sections or something like that. So rather than looking at the whole type, you just look at the closed terms of that type. Then you can get this mode, this uh, tininess to act on the closed terms. So if you kind of have the modal operator, then you can put the tininess in the root operation. Um, I have a question about something way near the beginning where I, th I think my intuition is misguided and I wanna know where, get it reguided properly. So you mentioned that in, with these classifying maps, unlike uh, say the sub-object classifier of the topos, mm -hmm. you don't have uniqueness of the classifying right. map. So in particular, if I've got a classifier for something or other, so the every something or other is classified by a map into it, mm -hmm. then a bigger object than that classifier is also going to serve, say, the co-product, this yeah. something else right. is also going to serve. Yep. So there's, uh, there's some choice involved in these things. And yeah. what, what worries me is how does that mesh with statements about classifiers being of pullbacks because if you're pulling back something and I made a choice for the one and for, in the co-domain and you made a choice in the other and we didn't coordinate it, uh, then uh, I, don't, I don't see the pullback coherence. And I suspect, as I said, I suspect I'm just missing something obvious, but tell me. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I think there, so there are two things to say about that. One is the Coherence of the pullbacks is kind of built in because of the way uh, things are set up. I have that type of vibration structures for all maps, not, not just for the classifier. And then I pick the classifying maps um, for the structured types as the ones given by that um, choice of vibration structures. So. The vibrations are assumed to be structured and that determines their classifying maps. But so um, saying it, instead of just wildly choosing classifiers all over the place with extraneous garbage in them, you do a decent construction and avoid the extraneous garbage. You do it, yeah, you do, but the, but the main point maybe is you do it once for the universal case and you, then you get the ones for all the other ones by pulling back the universal one. And then that automatically gives you a coherent choice for all the other ones. So, yeah. and so that's that. Once you have your choices, then I should be happy. Yep. But then there's another aspect here, which is kind of nice. And that is, although it's not unique, the classifying map is unique up to 
some further uh, information that uh, we didn't have available when we defined it, but you can show a posteriori that it's unique, for example, up to homotopy. So once you have done all the work, if you've made the choices correctly, then that univalence condition tells you exactly that equivalent fibrations will be classified by classifiers which are homotopic as functions into the universe because the paths in the universe correspond to equivalences. That's the univalence property. So univalence tells you that the classifier is really unique in the right homotopical sense, namely the classifying maps are unique up to homotopy. So to summarize, my, my, my problem initially was just with classifying map D that's something that has enough maps into it to classify all the stuff. Yeah. But then in fact, you construct classifying maps intelligently yep. so that everything coheres and you don't have to worry about, uh, about weird extra stuff in the classifying object. That's right. And then, and then you construct the classifier itself in a, in a clever way that allows you to show that it's actually univalent. So if you added a co, if you co-producted something on there, it would no longer be univalent. So the univalence condition can be seen as a kind of, you've compressed it down as far as you can, or it's a kind of quotient of a, uh, one that is too loose. You've quotiented it down so that it's unique, so that you have a uniqueness property that you want. Thanks. Sure. Um, do you want to see my discussion questions? Or does somebody else have other questions? May I ask, uh, Stephen? Sure. Yeah. Um, just a, a no. side question. Uh, in the beginning, you said uh, uh, the model uh, or OTT can be, set, uh, can be formalized in extension type theory. No? Yeah. Yep. Uh, can you do you assume the topos? But uh, I, be, I believe that you can assume a, a predicative topos. Yeah. Your underline. So yep. then uh, maybe you can um, uh, formalize the, everything back in type theory if yes. uh, you can. Uh, yeah, you have um, internal models. Uh, you yeah. can have internal yeah. models uh, in type theory. Yeah, in fact, theory. Yeah, in fact, that's been done in, I, I think, all of the kind of cases where people have done this, they've also formalized the models. And even this equivariant cubicle one has been formalized by Evan Cavallo. That's what I, where I mentioned that Evan is involved. He did the formalization. And so you can formalize all these models uh, if you do them in extensional type theory. And in fact, that leads to my discussion question. Thanks for asking. So I'm going to go on then and show you these questions that I had in mind. So there are two different ways to model hot right now. There's this kind of syntactic type theoretic logical one that we were just talking about where you have a, a theory in extensional type theory, right? And then you take the language of hot intentional Martin of type theory and translate it into that axiomatic theory. And then the other way of doing things is this Quillen model category approach where you make a Quillen model structure like an abstract homotopy theory, and then you interpret the language of homotopy type theory into that. So this is maybe a semantic approach or homotopical or geometric approach by contrast to this syntactical approach, okay? Now, I didn't really tell you how to do either of these specific things. I told you instead how to go from this one, how, from the syntactic one to the semantic one, although, I described the syntactic one kind of semantically too, but I didn't tell you how to do either of the translations. There's a lot of work involved on each side to actually build a model. What I did is I showed how to go from one to the other. And in particular, I didn't even go from one model to another. I just went from a presentation of a logical model, which I described as a pre-model. And I turned that into a presentation of a geometric model, which I described as a colon model structure. Right? I didn't actually make any models of hot. I turned a pre-model into a colon model structure. That's what I showed you how to do. So 
the, a final step would be a kind of comparison now, something like this. The resulting geometric model is equivalent to the logical one that we started with in the sense maybe that if you interpret hot into the Quillen model structure in the way that we know how to do, then it validates all the same judgments as the syntactic interpretation into the logical theory, maybe up to some, you know, difference between propositional and definitional equality or something else. So that's why the ish, you know, things are a little bit up in the air, but it seems pretty clear that we can do something like this if we set the definitions up right. So that's pretty good. And that leads to the following question, which geometric models admit such a logical presentation? Which ones can you do using this logical style, which can be formalized in extensional type theory in the way that Millie was just saying? Can you use that approach to capture, well, which Quillen model structures, which infinity toposes? The Quillen model structures that we're using, the geometric models, they all describe infinity topoi. So maybe that's my, it's, that's, somehow the converse of Schulman's theorem, right? Um, it's, that's much easier to prove than Schulman's theorem, I think. Um, so this says that, uh, and the logical presentations, they describe a certain kind of structured one topos, this structured one topos with a pre-model. So the question can be formulated entirely semantically, which infinity topoi can be presented in this way by a pre-model in a one topos? So it's another way of, a kind of semantic way of asking that same question, how many or which infinity topoi can be described using that syntactic approach of having an axiomatized theory in extensional type theory. So I think that's a possible discussion question. My own guess would be, you know, it's a pretty narrow range of all the infinity topoi that can be described in that way, but I could be wrong. Maybe that approach is much more flexible than I expect. It'd be nice to hear any opinions about that. Or if you don't have an opinion, at least it gives you a, a different point of view of what I was talking about today. So I'm comparing this kind of syntactical approach to modeling hot with this homotopical approach, semantical approach to modeling hot. So, so what are the uh, what are the degrees of freedom in choosing a pre-model? You choose a topos and a an interval class of cofibrations, a class of cofibrations, a universe, and a universe, and 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 something that I was not very explicit about. The actual filling conditions involving the cofibrations and the interval can change too, right? So there's some adjustment to be made there. Maybe you only fill from the endpoints of the interval, or maybe you slice over the interval and have a generic endpoint and you fill from that. So there are a couple of different approaches in the literature to what are the filling conditions. And we haven't even you know, gotten to comparing those different ones in the different cube categories. So there's some flexibility there too. There's a flexibility in the cubes, there's flexibility in the filling, condition, there's flexibility in the co-fibrations. So, so, so one thing you can do, of course, is you can start from any Gordon Day one topos and take cubical objects in it. Yep. Right. Right. So that, and that seems like, that seems like it gives you a reasonably wide class of infinity topoi this way, right? Yep. As long as you're looking at cubical ones, right? Well, so I mean, modulo the comparing the cubes with the simplices. Yeah. So, so you, you, I guess the, you're not going to get, um, so you, cause I mean, say, say you do the equivariant version of cubes. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, you still, because that's not, maybe not constructively valid, you might not get the same thing as say simplicial objects in a one topos. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
So there's going to be some gap there between the constructive and the classical and you, that will, that gap will be more or less critical depending on the topos you start with, the base topos in which the cubical things are valued. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess my guess would probably be that you can get some, but not all. I don't know about how narrow or wide the range you can get mm -hmm. is, but mm -hmm. that, that I can't think of any way that you could get all of them without adding some extra input that has to do with the topology on the, or the higher category as the domain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a question about the thing that Mike just talked about, sure. um, which is that does that have any sort of universal property? Like um, maybe what I'm asking is given a, a, a one topos, is there some sort of infinitification of it? If that makes yeah, any there's, sense. Yeah, there's a idea of a, um, what is it? Infinity topos envelope of a one topos, I think it's called, which is described by universal property, which is kind of described by the more or less obvious universal property. Um, and there are some results about the construction of that thing for specific, usually Grotendieck one toposes, mm -hmm. certain cases in which, in some cases, if you have a Grotendieck one topos present, you present it as sheaves on a site, mm -hmm. then if you take the simplicial sheaves on the same site, that gives you the infinity topos envelope of the one topos you started with. But that doesn't always hold. It's, I don't know what the condition is. Somebody like Mike or Mathieu Anel can probably say what the, it has to be, I don't know, there's some special condition. And then there are examples of toposes that don't work that way, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you could ask the same thing for an elementary, not necessarily Grotendieck topos. If you start with a one topos, can you find an elementary infinity topos that either has the universal property that we have in mind, or maybe that contains the one topos as the zero types in the infinity topos? So there are a couple of different ways of formulating that condition as well. Mm. And does that relate in any nice way to um, if you take, say, cubical objects instead? Good question. That's why we're in the discussion part here. This is kind of wide open, folks. I mean, these the comparison between the cubical stuff and the Quillen model structure stuff is we're just scratching the surface of it here. There's, you know, this, there's a whole school of models of hot based on cubical methods and cubical type theory, much of it not semantic, much of it done syntactically. And then there's this homotopical work based on cool and model structures. And that's what I'm trying to do here is bridge the gap. So almost any question that you're gonna ask me about that gap, the answer is gonna be, I don't know. I'm just kind of getting started. I think on that note, maybe we'll stop the, um, the recording, <laughs> just the recording okay. and the um, maybe the live streaming and see if we people want to discuss more openly. Sure.